Hello, welcome this evening. Welcome to our fourth COVID Facts Not Fear Town Hall discussion. This is our final in this particular series sponsored by the African-American Council of Elders and the Black Alliance. We're just gonna talk a little bit about COVID and what's going on right now. Currently, with regard to the pandemic nationwide, there are about 19 million cases with about 332,000 deaths at this point. In the state of Kansas, we have about 213 cases with about 2,500 deaths. And in Sedgwick County, we are about 37,000 cases with 256 deaths. Right now, unfortunately, we are leading in the state of Kansas. But we continue to work hard here in Wichita to do what we can to combat COVID and keep our cases and deaths down. The Council of Elders and the Black Alliance have continued with our collaborative Facts Not Fear outreach, education, and assistance campaign. One part of this campaign has been our free text alert system. And if you watch along the bottom, there will be um, on that ticker, it'll tell you how to get onto that text, but that you dial 484848 to get updates on healthcare and other issues that are important to the black community within uh, Wichita and the, the surrounding areas. Also part of the Facts Not Fair campaign has been a series of virtual town hall discussions to provide not only the African-American community in Wichita with valuable information, but black communities nationwide with what we all know um, in order to, to make sure that we survive. As we have uh, been talking about all of this, one of the things that we really are trying to emphasize is that we're all in this together. At the end of the day, whether you're black, whether you're brown, whether you're white, whether you are whoever, if you live in this community, if you live in this nation, this is affecting you in some way. Last week, we discussed the effects of the pandemic on mental health in our communities. And tonight, with the introduction of several COVID vaccines, we wanna discuss the very serious issue of should black and brown people take the COVID vaccine, why or why not? Tonight, we have a couple of panelists on for you. Our first panelist is Dr. Rita Stanley. We saw talk, kind of talked to her last week. She is a Kansas City-based internal medicine specialist offering alternative and holistic health services. Welcome, Dr. Stanley. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. Reagan Dehart. She is a family practice physician with the Grace Med Health Clinic here in Wichita. Good evening. Welcome, Dr. Dehart. Thank you. All right, we also have Dr. Maurice Duggins. He is a family physician with um, Essentia via Christie Medical Center in Wichita. Welcome, Dr. Duggins. Thank you, Van. It's good to be here. All right. And our last but not least is Dr. Dennis Oyango. He is a pulmonary and critical care specialist at Ascension via Christie. Welcome, Dr. Dennis. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be with you tonight. Awesome. We are going to have a great discussion. And we want to remind you that because we are live, because we are on Facebook, feel free to pop your questions in there. Feel free to ask questions. We want to make sure that your questions are being answered. Of course, I have some questions, but we want to make sure that we are answering your questions. All right. My first question is going to go to Dr. Dehart. And I know that you are in a clinic. And uh, because of that, you're working with families in that clinic. You're dealing with African-American and Hispanic families. What are you telling patients about the vaccine? Well, I tell them that it's safe. I've already had my vaccine last week. The only thing I experienced was a little bit of muscle pain um, in my arm for a couple of days. Um, if you you have to weigh, weigh the risk against the benefit, our risk is becoming very ill at the time. Uh, versus the benefit of living. We are at that point where we are getting close to its life or its death. We still don't know what we don't know about this disease. We don't know who it's going to affect in the most severe manner. So um, we have to take it, gotta take it. So, as you're looking at those different populations, so as you're looking at the, the various populations that are coming through the clinic, mm -hmm. is there a particular thing that you're seeing in common with, the, with, your, client, with your patients? Absolutely. Um, especially in our, our marginalized populations, our black and our brown people, we are the people that are working on the front line. 
And the de definition of front lines is evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, first we thought police officers and firemen. Mm -hmm. We forgot about the people who clean in the hospital. We forget about people who clean up in the stores that we, we frequent. Um, and these are, the, are, are people who have lots of chronic health problems, people who are already of lower um, socioeconomic status. They can't take off work. They don't have COVID pay. Um, they have to support their family so they go to work whether they are sick or well. And these are the populations that I serve. These are the populations who are, are at greatest risk right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I do agree that we, when we started to look at that ideal of frontline workers, when we started to look at who are the people that are out there, we didn't think about the, gro the people that are getting our groceries, the people that are cleaning, the people that are doing some of those jobs that we don't think about that are kind of undercover. But if they weren't doing them, we would have real issues. That we do every day done. Even that person that's picking up our trash, because you know there there is some level in which there can be some contamination there. And so I think we those are people that we haven't thought about. And so I, I appreciate you bringing that up, um, Dr. Oyango. I understand that you at some point did contract the virus, correct? So kind of tell us a little bit about what that experience was like for you. You know, I think fevers uh, and and sweats and muscle aches. You no, know, which is like I didn't know what it was initially. You know, I thought mm -hmm. it was, you know it was just something coming along, tried to shake it off. But the week before, I'd, I'd been taking care of a patient that was very sick. And I thought I'd been exposed to him. Uh, after one week of uh, muscle aches and sweats, that's when I started having a cough and shortness of breath, and it was scary. The biggest thing was the anxiety of not knowing you know, what to expect. And given my, my practice, I'd seen a lot of patients suffer and die from it. And so I was also anxious, you know, that you know, the same you know, before me. And so uh, it was a, a very trying moment, at least three or four days when I thought I was, you know, the most sickest with a lot of cough and shortness of breath. And then slowly things started getting better. You know? And uh, it was a relief you know, that I felt like I was getting better after maybe a week or two. Wow. So mm -hmm. as you think about that, was, so was anybody else in your household affected? No, not really. Uh, fortunately, you know, I live I live away from my family. My family is in Kansas City, and I live in Wichita, okay. and I have to visit them. But by the time I visited, by the time I was visiting them, I was having symptoms. But I didn't know it was COVID at the time. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I was interacting with them as usual. And then when I came back, uh, that's when I tested positive. But luckily, I think by the time I was showing up there, I was probably not as infectious. So mm -hmm. they were all negative. So it was it was a relief for me that all of them got negative. Uh, so uh, I didn't I didn't expose anyone, at least in my family. So do we see that as being um, an issue in the fact that because the symptoms are so similar to the things that we would have going on in the fall anyway? So I could say, you know, this feels like my allergies. This just feels like uh, maybe I worked out too much and I'm sore because I worked out or maybe I have a little touch of the flu. So how are we telling people what, you know, what are we doing and how are we having those conversations so that people really realize that this is not just the everyday run of the mill things that they would be getting in the fall. You know, unfortunately, what you're saying is very right. You know, earlier on in the symptom, the symptoms can be very mild. You know, they can be like a little bit of muscle ache, a little bit of sweats, maybe a little bit of fever. And by the, by the time people realize that they're sick, they've already you know, spread it to other persons. You know, so people mm -hmm. are very vigilant you know, with mild symptoms, to be very you know, uh, 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 vigilant that whenever they have any symptoms that's unusual, they should think about getting tested. Uh, unfortunately, you know, people don't know. Uh, by the time people get sick, it usually tends to be around day 10, day 14, and when the symptoms tend to be more severe, and people get more concerned. And by that time, they've already spread it to their family you know, and their friends, and they've, they've all been you know, exposed. So the best thing that people can do during this time is to be more cautious by wearing your mask, staying away from gatherings, staying away from exposing other persons that you don't know if you have it. You know, Because mm -hmm. by the time you realize that you have it, you've already spread it. So one more question for you and then we'll move on. Um, I know that you are you, you are a pulmonary specialist and a lot of this uh, disease really affects our respiratory system. And I know from experience having a, a person in our congregation who had it 
Uh, stroke can happen as a side effect. So what are you kind of seeing in, in the pulmonary uh, respiratory uh, situation that's happening? So I would say the last nine months, you know, I think I will say they've been an agonizing nine months. You know. We've seen a lot of suffering. You know, people come in with shortness of breath, they can't breathe. You know, and initially when they come in, they look like they're having a little bit of struggle. You know, but as time goes by, as the disease is catching up with them, you know, they get more and more short of breath uh, to the point that we have to breathe, put them on a, on a breathing machine to support their lung. Because what, what the COVID does, because a lot of inflammation in your lungs and your lungs get stiff. Usually the lungs are more like a balloon, so it's very easy for you to inflate in and out and breathe in and out. But as you get a lot of inflammation, the lungs get stiffer, they get become more like leather. And so your walk of breathing becomes very difficult. As a matter of fact, today I was just seeing a patient, you know, and he was telling me, you know, I'm tired, you know, I mean, I'm tired of breathing. I, ca I can't do this anymore, you know, because you can't get any comfortable position that you can feel comfortable in his breathing. And I saw another gentleman as well saying the same thing, you know, saying that, you know, when you look at his face, you can see a lot of despair. Initially, when he came in, he was very optimistic, but right now, as the disease is catching up with him and he's getting weaker and more short of breath, and you can sense in him that he's sensing that you know, maybe death is imminent. You know, so, and look in his eyes and you can see that he has fear. You know, he's afraid of what's coming. You know. And unfortunately, when you try to reassure him, you've seen a lot of the same cases before. And you've seen what's happened to them. And you can try to give him some hope, but the hope is not there. You know, we know that it's likely more, more, more than not that he's going to end up on a breathing machine and eventually possibly die. So uh, the lungs get really damaged. People get scarred. We've seen patients stay in the hospital for more than two months, uh, three months, and even then they've not recovered. They still need some time to recover. So they lose their jobs, they lose their livelihood. People have lost their loved ones and family. So it's a very, it's a multi, I would say, you know, uh, affects you know, multiple systems and multiple livelihoods in patients' lives. Do you see the question down below? How long did it take for your oxygen level to, to kind of level out? No, I was lucky that my oxygen level you know, got down to 92%. So it really didn't go that low. And I would say maybe because of my age, you know, and, and being healthy, I would say, because I was a little bit active. So I didn't get that sick, you know, but uh, all the patients, you know, who have other risk factors that we know about, right now we see people who have diabetes, uh, who tend to be mostly African-Americans, you know, people who are obese because of the socioeconomic issues tend to be African-Americans and, and older. Those tend to have severe disease and that's what we're seeing in the hospital. They tend to get much more sicker and the oxygen you know, drops down uh, usually, if you're going to recover, it will be probably around you know two to three weeks before you start seeing some improvement. But uh, I've seen patients you know be sick for like two or three months. You know, so, wow, Dr. Stanley, mm -hmm. uh, I see you saying yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing? Um, I know that you're in that Topeka, Kansas City area. Mm -hmm. um, what what are what are you seeing happening? Now, I'm not on the front line, so I'm not in the hospital. I'm not in the ICU. Um, I do more outpatient uh, functional medicine, but I've done telemedicine for the entirety of this pandemic. So back in March, April, May, um, just constant telephone calls from people who were having symptoms. They were just hearing about COVID, didn't know whether they had it, testing wasn't available. So spent a lot of time and had to learn rather rapidly about this new infection. I mean, it's a novel virus and everybody has been learning along the way. So my experience has not been one-on-one -on -one in an office setting or hospital setting, but primarily on the telephone. And at one point when New York was an epicenter, we actually had limited um, ability um, to actually practice. And I was talking to people in New York and New Hampshire and Delaware um, because their systems were so overwhelmed and people couldn't go into the ER. They couldn't go to their doctor. Wow. So a lot of it was around education um, and helping people understand as much as we knew at the time, um, helping them understand the symptoms that they can't ignore, even though, yes, the ER is full of people with COVID. If you're having shortness of breath, you can't breathe, you've got chest pressure, you, st you need to go have some in-person care. So lots of education, uh, lots of encouragement. There's lots of anxiety on there. So my what I've seen has been in that role. Um, and it did get better, but now it's ramping up again. We're heading into flu season. Like you were saying, people don't know, what is this? Is this my allergy? Is this mm -hmm. flu? And literally, 
you cannot tell them, oh, this is just for sinuses. We can't, I can tell you, it sounds like it could be just routine sinusitis, but in my mind at this point, because there's the, the rates of positivity are so high, it's COVID until proven otherwise. And I'm not trying to be paranoid that everything is COVID because people still get common things. However, to me, the worst thing we can do is just to blow it off, treat it with antibiotics, which are not going to have COVID, as far as I know, certainly not as an outpatient, um, and, and direct them to get testing. And fortunately in Kansas, or at least in the Topeka area, um, the testing in asymptomatic people has become more available because up until really what, the last couple of weeks, right. we had to have symptoms in order to be tested. True. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what our positivity rate looks like as the testing is more widely available. I think the number will come down some, but, um, but yeah, for me, it's been a lot of supportive guidance, um, direct, directing people to get care, when to get care, um, and also on, in my own personal practice, really helping people understand that they do have power around some things, like what they're eating, uh, mm -hmm. about uh, knowing what their vitamin D level is, or if you can't get a check now, then still, you know, based on a lot of the science that's coming out, come out of this pandemic, vitamin D can help, particularly in people of color. So a lot of mine is just get uh, letting people know you do have control you do have some control um we don't have treatment for mild symptoms or asymptomatic disease but you have control over what you put in your body so that your immune system will, will have a better uh time of doing what it's created to do so last week you brought up um when we talked about the vaccine and you brought up something and you said uh at the end of the day i will take it when I need to take it because I want to live. And I, and, and uh, Dr. Um, Oyanga just said the same thing. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that. What is, you know, as we, I think there's this fear of the unknown. Sure. Um, and so, you know, the vaccine is unknown. We don't know. Um, Dr. Dehart said she took it, you know, she didn't really necessarily have symptoms, but it's still new. It, mm -hmm. It's a, it's a novel thing at this point. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that ideal of I want to live, what are what are we having? How do we have those conversations? Well, you know, we understand why there's so much distrust, mistrust in our community, especially based on some history. But I also think we, I think it's interesting that we're in Kwanzaa. Mm -hmm. um, I love the seven principles of Kwanzaa, and they speak to this pandemic as far as I'm concerned. I would you agree. Know, unity in the community, uh, self determination. Um, you know, making sure that it's a collective work. So when I say I want to live, I'm, I'm really saying I want to live for me and I want to live for the people around me. I want to live for the children and the older people. I want to do what is right for me by getting the vaccine. But I also want to help people as much as I can to really understand the facts around these vaccines. And so we can put to rest some of these um fears based on lack of um, real actual facts. So to live for me is not to just live for me. For me to live means that other people will live that mm -hmm. I care about. Dr. Yanger, you wanted to say something on that? And then we're coming to you, Dr. Duggins, I promise. Oh, sure. I have to what the personalities mentioned. You know, as a kid by now, I think you have to think about what the alternative is. And the alternative what we have right now is that we have no effective treatment for COVID-19, but you know, COVID-19 disease. So then when you look at the way people are suffering, and that, like I told you about the gentleman that I saw today, you know, I'm sure if I offer them a vaccine, they'll be they'll be willing to take it. You know, and even right now, I think since I would say since since March or maybe April, we've been giving people some kind of sort of vaccination that we're using. It's called passive vaccination, passive vaccine. What we're doing is we're taking you know patients other patients' plasma that have recovered and giving it to, to patients who are sick. Unfortunately, that does not work very well, you know, because by the time you're giving it to you, you're already sick for with the disease. So it's better to train your body before you see the disease. And so by the time it's coming towards you, at least you can fight it off. Uh, so the vaccination idea has always been there uh, and we, we, we've been doing it, I mean, already, but it's very effective what we're using. So what we have right now that's coming up 
I think it's the best vaccine so far uh, that we should, you know, we should be running to. Thank you. So, Dr. Duggins, I saw you on Facebook the other day. You got the, you got your vaccination, and you were uh, getting it on Facebook. Tell us about that. Yeah, I uh, being in one of the frontline people, I figured I needed to go ahead and uh, get my vaccine. Uh, it's not just for me, but to help protect the people around me, my family and uh, my community. Uh, the community itself need to have an example uh, that it's a safe vaccine to be taken. And if I'm gonna put myself out there to take it, hopefully they'll recognize that it's, uh, if I think it's safe, that hopefully they'll think it's also safe. Um, it's been tested uh, with thousands of people uh, and it has demonstrated good efficacy. So we just needed to get enough people uh, comfortable with the idea of being vaccinated instead of uh, dying from COVID, um, like so many have already. Uh, we unfortunately have too many African American dying disproportionately from COVID. Uh, again, as Oyengo said earlier, and as Dr. Stanley and Dehart uh, alluded to, there is a disease process that affects us disproportionately. There is the fact that we also have so many people that work in the service industry and essential workers as well. So it, it's important for us to get the vaccine as soon as we have it available. Um, I was recently informed that uh, they're uh, bringing it in, into the community through some of the FQHC centers that we have, the federally qualified health centers that we have in the community. So that's good because I think that we'll also get more people vaccinated. Mm -hmm. So did you have any side effects? My only side effect was the following day, I felt some soreness in my left arm where I got the shot. Uh, beyond that, uh, nothing. Uh, it was all good. Um, it's uh, from, from other than the soreness and the deltoid. So I was good. Um, I didn't have any weakness. I didn't have any slowdown in my work activities. Uh, I never got a fever, nothing of the sort. I just went along with my regular daily uh, activities. Okay. So here's what we're, we're going to kind of open it up. I'm going to just ask some questions because I want us to have a little bit more discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is this whole concept that when you get a shot, when you get a vaccine, that they're giving you the disease. Is that true? No, not really. You know, the vaccine, this, there's, there's different kinds of vaccine, you know, but this vaccine, what they're doing is they're giving you a protein that's similar to what, you know, uh, it's kind of a precursor to a protein that's what that's similar to the virus. And so your body then gets trained, you know, by seeing this protein, you know, which mimics the virus protein. And then your body then can learn with time to fight the virus when the virus comes through. The protein that we're giving you is the most important part of the virus. So when your body sees that, you can at least learn how to fight it. If you, if they're talking about getting a virus, the flu vaccine is a virus that's been weak. You know? So if you get like a nasal spray. You know, uh, that's a live, live virus. And we, we've been giving people the flu vaccine for, for a long period of time. And so, so there is a difference between how the flu, the flu vaccine works and how this particular vaccine works. That's correct, because this vaccine is not a complete uh, bacterial virus for that, for that, for that purpose. You know, it's just part of a protein on the virus, on the virus itself. So it's not, it's not going to multiply in you or you cannot spread it to someone else if you got it. You know? mm -hmm. So it's totally different compared to uh, the, the, flu, the flu vaccine or, or even the polio vaccine, which actually, if you got it, you could easily spread to someone else. Okay. And, what were you well, going to say, Reagan? Oh, I was going to say that the reason why everyone is so excited about this vaccine is because of the the, the science that has, has gone into it. Over these hundreds of years of research on disease, we have figured out a way that we may be in the future be able to fight almost any kind of virus through it's through a technology called mRNA, messenger RNA, which is part of our cells. It's a, uh, a signaling. It's a signal. There's a signal in this vaccine. It's not. It's not. Not the the virus. It's a signal um, from the virus itself. We can now. We now have the technology that we will be able to emulate signals mm. from 
any kind of virus potentially that our population comes into contact with. That's why we're so quickly, once once they found that technology and they quickly brought that to the market, that's why we're, we're so excited about it, me personally. I, I had some pep in my step, honestly, after I received my vaccine last week. I, like Dr. Duggins, had some pain localized in my arm where the shot received the day after, not even the day after. The day after I woke up, my arm was a little cool. But I, I felt a pep. And I know that was mostly psychological, but um, we're, we're part of history. We're becoming part of history. So that's, um, that's exciting. And that's a, a way to hopefully inspire um, our patients. So and as we look at, go ahead. Dr. Uh, and the two that are available now that got the emergency use authorization, yeah. the Pfizer and the Moderna, and those are already being given in this country. Uh, Pfizer was first. Did you all get mm -hmm. Pfizer or? Moderna. Moderna. I got Pfizer. Yeah. And they're both the mRNA. And I agree with you, Dr. Dehart. I'm fascinated by that technology, um, just intellectually, but just knowing that um, they've been able to get, I call it the recipe, the mRNA, the recipe for the spike protein on the virus. So it's very specific to that part of the virus that attaches to our cells and causes the infection. So if we can develop neutralizing antibodies to that spike protein, then the likelihood of us now, what we don't quite know is do people still get infected after the vaccine? Mm -hmm. What we do know is people don't get the severe, the severe infection, which is killing black people, people of color. Um, so it is really powerful. Um, the fact that that has come to bear right now during this pandemic. So the question is, and this was the question that we were going to ask next. Um, if you've already had COVID, should you get the vaccine? Yes, you're encouraged to get the vaccine even if you've had COVID uh, because we don't know how long your immune system is going to uh, be able to protect you. Um, I've had several of my peers who've developed COVID still come through and have the vaccine taken. And uh, the CDC has encouraged anyone who've had COVID to still take uh, the vaccine. There's some who've actually gone through and checked their um antibody levels mm -hmm. and felt, well, they can wait uh, before they take it. Uh, but most people are not doing that. And, and it's recommended if you've had it, just go ahead and take the vaccine. That was getting ready to be my next question. So that we have this whole piece of, I've got the antibody, I don't need to worry about it. And if I have the antibody and I, and so literally somebody just told me this the other day, I don't have to worry about it. I got the antibody mm -hmm. and my doctor told me that every time I come in contact with somebody who has COVID, that my antibodies get strengthened. Uh, and, I, and I think the concern is we don't know how effective you can have measurable antibody. But the real question is, is it neutralizing? Is it effective enough to keep people from getting because um, there have been um, people who have been reinfected, not a lot. Um, around the country, around the world. But so there's still a question about whether presence of antibody equals effectiveness of antibody. And the other issue is, you know, people don't know how long the controls are going to be around mm -hmm. to protect you. I mean, initially we thought it was three months, people say maybe six months. So it's not really clear, you know, how long those antibodies are going to be around to protect you. So with the vaccine, at least you're given some, at least the same thing, three months or more, you know, before the protection can wear off. So you all took the vaccine. Do which do both of you need to get a second dose or which which needs a second dose? Both of them. Both of them. Okay. And so how, how quickly do you take that second dose? Three weeks for the Pfizer vaccine and uh, four weeks for the Moderna vaccine. Yes. But everyone has to get two uh, injections recommended. Mm -hmm. However, from your immune system is activated from the first injection and it's actually building up those antibodies from the first injection. Mm -hmm. The second is like a booster to just get it over the top, increase the efficacy of uh, protection for you. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, go ahead, ahead, Dr. Stanley. And the studies have shown that even after one injection of Pfizer, I think there's 50% um, effectiveness. But you still want to get the second one. You don't want to be happy with 50. Effective how quickly? Uh, I think I read where it was like two weeks, two weeks after the first injection, they were able to measure enough 
you know, of, of the antibody to say that there was 50% effectiveness. So if I go get a if I go get a, a vaccine today, mm -hmm. is there a period of time when I still need to probably be very cautious before you know it kicks in, if if you will? Oh no, I was pretty good. Day zero as the on six months down the road. We can't let off the gas with our mitigation efforts of wearing your mask, avoiding crowds, washing your hands. Just because we have the vaccine does not mean that we're 100% safe. What it is, is that if we come into contact, we are less likely to develop severe illness that could be life-threatening. We could still possibly catch COVID, um, though it is more likely that it would be a mild case. So let's reiterate that because I want people to be very clear about this fact. Just because you get the vaccine does not mean that you cannot get COVID. It just means that it will not be as severe. Just like if you get the flu shot, doesn't mean that you won't get the flu. It just means that you're probably not gonna die from it. That's right. So we need, I want us to be very clear about that, that we want you to get the vaccine, but we want you to also be very conscientious that getting the vaccine does not give you the red flag to go out and do whatever you want to do and be like, oh, I have the I have the pass. Mm -hmm. right. Correct. Okay. And you All want right. to encourage other people to continue the mitigation system, as Dr. Dehart said, uh, because you don't know who else in the community hasn't had the vaccine to that day. Uh, you may have had it, but they may not have had it. Um, and you may actually be encouraging people to expose other people who are not um, vaccinated to the virus. There is a chance, uh, which hasn't been proven yet, there's a chance uh, that even after you've gotten vaccinated that you could be transmitting the virus for a certain time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's best, once you've, if you've gotten the vaccine, go ahead and continue to do the mitigation things. Wear your mask, wash your hands, and avoid large crowds. If you're in a crowd, make sure you're, you're, you're wearing a mask. And is minimize there, the amount of time, minimize the, the amount of time that you're in any crowd because once okay. you get to to a certain amount of time, 15 minutes or more, it can make it more likely for you to get infected. Is there anybody that should not take the vaccine? Yes, so I think the first that I will think about is in the studies that were done, you know, there's some people who are definitely excluded from the studies, you know. And what comes to mind really is people who are pregnant you know, pre or expecting. You know, so for those persons, I would say that they, they, should not, they should not necessarily get it, but you have to discuss with your doctor based on your risk factors, because you could be at high risk you know, from dying from it. And so you got to make a decision as to whether to get the vaccine or not. And if you have diabetes, you're obese, those patients seem to do worse with COVID. So I think it would be better for you to discuss with your you know, doctor first before you know, thinking about getting it or not. But definitely people who are pregnant were not involved in the study. So this will be the first category I would say they should not get it. The other category is, you know, young, younger persons, persons who are studied were more than 16 years of age. So young persons are not studied in this uh, study. So them, they're not also eligible for this vaccine so far. Okay. Anybody else that we would say needs to, someone ask if they have COPD, should they get it? Oh yeah, definitely. COPD is one of the you know, uh, uh, high risk categories. People who don't, do, don't don't fare very well if they get the disease. So definitely, if you have COPD or any lung disease or diabetes or, or heart failure, uh, you need to get it. If you have concerns, you know, because of your your disease, the best thing is just to call your doctor and discuss the options, see if you should get it or not. Yeah, one more thing I would add: with yeah. it's anyone who has had any severe reaction to vaccines before, they need to also discuss that with their physician because a physician may actually have to advise them either not to do it or use certain precautions if they go ahead and do it. For example, there was a physician himself that went ahead and took the vaccine, uh, but he has his EpiPen, which is sort of a rescue drug mm -hmm. because he knew that he tends to have severe reactions to the vaccine. So he was ready. So when he got it and he had his reaction, he took his EpiPen and he was just fine after that. So that was one of the questions that came up is if you have allergies, is that such, should you take it? And so, again, seeking your physician and and looking at what your particular allergy is would be the, the, the most prudent thing for prudent thing for you to do. Mm -hmm. 
that, that's cool. Correct. Okay, so there's a question, and Dr. Stanley, this is in your lane. They said, what can we do? What should we be eating? What should we be taking to boost our immunity? And I know that you are a huge proponent of food as medicine. Yes. So talk to us a little bit about that. What should we be doing? What should we be eating? What should we uh, be taking right now to boost our immunity? Sure. And, um, you know, most people know what I'm going to say intellectually. We've heard this. Um, but there are certain things that your immune cells are either going to benefit from or it's going to be a detriment. And I'll say sugar, simple carbs, sugar, actually, there's a couple of things. It actually blocks the uptake of vitamin C into the immune cells. And we know that our immune cells. So the more sugar and free car uh, simple carbs that you have, it's going to make your vitamin C less effective in supporting your immune cells. Um, so, you know, and, and we always are, I don't want to put, during this pandemic, comfort food has been comfortable, for us, but it has been a detriment because the more we eat comfort foods, the more insulin that we become, because sugar causes inflammation. Um, COVID is an inflammatory disease because when you look at the immune system, the immune system is beneficial because it creates inflammation. When we see patients get death from email, it's not because the immune system wasn't working sometimes. It's just that for some people, it's over. It's like our immune system dysregulates. So in the process of trying to kill the virus, it produces a lot of different cytokines and things that are detrimental to the human body. So I start with sugar. I mean, sugar should be limited um, as much as possible. Certainly, Eating green, leafy, we know this intellectually. Eating vegetables and fruits, limited fruits, because you can get trouble in trouble with that sugar. And I know some people don't have ready access to that. But I think that all of us can be better, even if it's just limiting food, drinking more water, getting more water, getting seven or eight hours of sleep. Those things that we think are not important are extremely important. And for people of color, again, I can't overstate this. You absolutely must support your vitamin D level. And right now, it's not a perfect scenario. Some people can't get the levels measured. But you can assume if you are a person of color with pigment in your skin, your vitamin D level is less than 50. I can only tell you my experience with hundreds of patients in my functional medicine practice. I don't think I've ever seen a person of color have a, a good optimal vitamin D level. And one thing that this pandemic has revealed, and there, now there are studies that have come out of this pandemic that, that demonstrate the association of low vitamin D with not only getting infected, but in severity of COVID disease. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to use the word treatment, although there's a couple of studies that use that word. But I can't, I can't tell you, if you don't do anything else, support your vitamin D. But certainly you can make some dietary and other lifestyle changes. Dr. Dehart, you're shaking your head. What is? Are there any other things that you would suggest? You're muted, baby. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I agree with all of those things. Um, and one thing we said is about our access to, you know, healthy foods, and like the, this disease has really brought to light um, the disparities mm -hmm. um, between the haves and the have-nots. You know, in, in the population that I work with, you can't even always say between, you know, black and brown and white. Um, it's between the haves and the have-nots. In our population, they don't always have access to healthy foods. They're foods that they eat things out of a box. Mm -hmm. And those are the foods um, that are highest in those simple sugars and the high fats. They don't live in neighborhoods that are safe enough to get outside and exercise. We're in the dead of winter where there's no sun and access to uh, sun to activate our vitamin D. So, the most simple thing that I've been able to tell people is stay away from the cold food and at least take a multivitamin. That's the, drink more water. Stay away from alcohol. 
try your best to stop smoking. And so people have we have to, we have to give each other grace. And people, all we can do is the, the very best thing to do. So if the best you can do is to take a vitamin and get outside and walk up the block and back home, you know, a few days in the week, please do that. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. So our comfort food needs to be uh, green vegetables. So we need to be eating greens and cornbread versus cookies. Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, come on now. You got to give me something. Come on. Come on, Dr. Stanley. Come on. We have this conversation all the time. I mean, you got to give me something. You know, I'm hardcore. And I don't know whether it's because I'm older. Um, and I've actually seen people do these things. <laughs> Even in even when they don't have great access, so I don't. I my thinking, and I think it's because I am older, and there's just so much power that we do still hold. And I don't shame people, I don't beat people up, but I'm going to make sure you have that information, um, so that you can make the choices when you can make the choices, because there just isn't a whole lot. And if we're going to live and live well, even beyond this pandemic, <sighs> yeah. Hey, do you want to share with us your slide? Oh, sure. Yeah, just yeah. really quickly. And it's really going to reinforce what we've all been saying. I'll just move through them really quickly. I think Holly has them. Mm -hmm. And I, what I really wanted to do with these slides is you know, people are fearful of the vaccine. I want to put out the truth of what's found in these studies around symptoms you can expect. Symptoms that you can expect that are common, that you don't have to be scared of because they the symptoms really reflect your immune system responding um, to the actual spike protein that's being produced in your body. So I just want people to see some truths. I'm a visual learner and I'll move through. This is just a reminder, this slide, of how much more Blacks, African-American, Hispanic, Latinx, how much more frequently, and Native Americans actually die from COVID. So this, I would say 3%, three times as much mortality in the African-American um, community. Next slide. And this is just a comparison, just a, a real quick glimpse of, we've talked about the mRNA vaccine and how it works. I compared Pfizer and Moderna and again, the two doses, uh, Pfizer 21 days apart, Moderna for one month, 28 days apart. And Pfizer had participants 16 years and older. Moderna had participants 18 years and older. But both of them were found to be 94 to 95% effective after two doses and at least 50% after only one dose. Both of them have gone through rigorous, rigorous safety assessment and received their emergency use authorization and are being used. Um, and a lot of people say, oh, that was so fast. I, I, I don't trust it. Well, you have to know that just like Dr. Uh, Dehart said, there was science going on behind the scenes way before this pandemic that made use of mRNA seemingly happen fast. But you have virologists that have been working on the M mRNA for years. It's their life work. Um, and also the phases one, two, three, uh, the three phases in the trials, they were stacked. So instead of you know uh, phase one and then phase two, they did have to do some things relatively uh, simultaneously. And that may make it seem like it happened fast. It did happen fast. Let me say that again. It did happen fast, but not without the safety um, guidelines that every vaccine has to go through. And there were over 70,000 participants um, in phase one, two, and now three, because they're still in phase three. Next slide. And here's what I, I say to my friends and the people that I influence and my patients, expect this because it was 85% in the, in the actual study had arm injection, 84.1% had one or two days of pain at the injection site. If you don't, then wonderful. Muscle pain, 38.3%, injection at the injection site, swelling, and so on. So there's some expectation that there is some discomfort, even systemically. 
So six, almost 63% of people have fatigue, 63% headache, chills, joint pain. So this is not to scare you, but just so if you have these symptoms, you won't think that something is wrong. Next slide. And these are the uncommon or rare, but serious and reportable things that can potentially happen. Um, anaphylaxis, and we've seen uh, several people already, I think with Pfizer, maybe one with Moderna, uh, something called multi-system inflammatory syndrome, which is usually seen in children, that particular syndrome. Um, cases of COVID-19 after administration of the vaccine, resulting in hospitalization or death. Shoulder injury, and this is right out of their brief, so I didn't make this up. Shoulder injury or syncope related to vaccine administration within seven days. And there's even been a report of something called Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Uncommon, rare, serious, reportable. Next slide. And you, some, you asked this question, who are the high-risk groups? And they call these vaccine recommended, but with discussion and consent. So that's pregnant or breastfeeding women, people with autoimmune disease, people who are immunocompromised either because of cancer or, or an autoimmune disease where they're on lots of medications. Um, so over time, you know, we're still gathering safety data. So as people are starting to get immunized, um, there, will be, there will be younger children included in some studies. Um, there will possibly be known pregnant um, and breastfeeding women who are included in studies. Right now, they were not intentionally included in the first um, phase one, two, and three. Um, so there is no blanket statement. Basically, you discuss and get consent from people who are considered in those high-risk groups. Um, the CDC and the advisory committee recommends the vaccine, but consultation with an OB doctor is still advised. Next slide. What's still unclear about the vaccine, whether it's effective and safe for children less than 16, but they're gonna start doing some studies in younger, in younger people. How long the vaccine protection lasts? Will we have to get it annually like we do with flu vaccine? We don't know that yet. Um, and the safety and effectiveness in pregnant and breastfeeding feeding women, but they, they will start looking at that closer as well. Next slide. Here's a, we all were in agreement with this, immunized patients should still adhere to all CDC COVID precautions. Even once you get your vaccine, even when you get your second dose of vaccine, mask, social distancing, hand washing, caution with high risk contacts. The next slide. Next, I think that's it, that's it. Thank you. Uh, we are, we're getting some great feedback on those uh, on that information. Th there's a question. Can drinking lime water or eating lemons and breathing in hot steam be served as a home remedy? And I'm sure, you know, as we're looking at all of the things that we have done, thinking about black culture, we can create some, some concoctions to make some stuff go away. Is this a, an effective remedy or effective thing that we should be doing? Well, I'll say this, you know, lime and lemons, what you're getting from that is vitamin C, which we know is beneficial to the immune system, but it's not, a, it's certainly not a treatment. Um, it's not going to, you know, I don't want people to think that it will treat COVID or cure it, but certainly it'll provide to your immune system something important like vitamin C and the hot steam will help open you up. But um, not cure or treat that I know of. So anybody else have any, you know, things that you, you know, at, at the end of the day, we, we get these wives tales, if you will. And so people kind of start, uh, Facebook is a, is a, uh, a great tool, but in some ways we start to share all of these things that people have tried. So what are some things that you are recommending for, um, and anybody can answer this question. What are uh, rec things that you're recommending for people? If um, I think Dr. Um, Youngwe uh, oh, Yango, I'm, I'm going to get it right. Um, I think he kind of said earlier that there are some things that you could be doing at home, but 
we don't want to make it worse. So what are y'all recommending? You know, I think most people have uh, supportive treatment, you know, uh, at home, if you have a fever, you can take some Tylenol or ibuprofen. Uh, you can take some cough syrup if you're coughing too much. Uh, there's other cough medications to suppress the cough, if it's, you know, uh, keeping you up at night. So those can help, you know, as regards to the other, you know, herbal remedies that are out there, people have talked about garlic, you know, ginger. I'm not sure if those really help, you know, uh, but as, not, as long as you're not doing something in overuse, you know, you're not overusing it to a toxic, you know, situation. I mean, if you want to have chew on garlic or chew on ginger, that's up to you. But I don't think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, significantly helpful or, or, or curative, or, or, so to say, as Dr. Stanley mentioned. So I would just say that the regular things that we're used to is what you should do, you know, Tylenol, Motrin, or something just to treat your fever. You chew it on garlic, you won't have to worry about social distancing. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Zeggins. The, the, the one thing that I always try to explain to people is that anytime you have anything that causes a fever, you have to remember you have to stay hydrated. Mm -hmm. Getting dehydrated is one of the worst things you can do. Uh, sometimes you just feel tired. You feel sick to your stomach. You just don't want, you don't have the energy. You don't feel like you have the energy to get up and uh, drink something. But you need to drink rehydration fluids. Uh, if that's just water, that's great. But you need to make sure you're staying hydrated anytime you have anything that's associated with a fever um, because you can get dehydrated really fast and that can put you in trouble. Um, so Tylenol, alternate with motion if you need to. Uh, but definitely stay hydrated. I'd push that over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I just, one other point, I don't think anyone is saying that taking the vitamin is going to prevent COVID or is going to mm -hmm. treat COVID. I think everyone understands that this is just boosting your system and your system hopefully will then fight the disease. So someone asked a question, is a Z pack or steroid pack good with helping with COVID? So, <clears throat> Uh, there's there's not really strong evidence for for the for the ZPAC. You know, uh, we do use steroids, you know, uh, in in patients in, in the hospital. And so, uh, but I think that needs to be evaluated by a doctor first before they can prescribe that. You know, because the treatment of it is slightly different. The dosing is different. So I would not not necessarily recommend that people try those at home by themselves. I think you need somebody to guide you through it. Some patients might not qualify for it because the indication for it is patients who have uh, a severe disease requiring oxygen. That's when we consider steroids. So, but if you're at home and you're not, you're not that sick, then I think doing a steroid pack at home is probably not of much benefit to you. And if you really need a steroid pack, it should be in the hospital and being evaluated you know, more than you know, being at home. And I believe there's some evidence that if you use steroids too early in the infection, you can actually affect the um, immune system negatively. Mm. So I think the timing, like, like Dr. Olinga was saying, the timing of steroids is important. Um, and generally hospitalization and the dexamethasone, that's later or with more severe infection, as I understand it. And again, like, like we said before, I mean, there is no cure. There's no yeah. cure for it. This is all supportive treatment. Mm -hmm. Just not kind of like minimize the inflammation in your lungs. Mm -hmm. and so that's why this vaccine seemed like a game changer. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a pivotal moment that we have to take advantage mm -hmm. of and you know, stay away from it. Because there's nothing else that can, can protect us from the disease or, or cure the disease, so to say. Just a clarification there again is that uh, ZPAC is a is azithromycin, which is an antibiotics. Antibiotics do not do anything for the virus. Antibiotics does not stop a virus. Uh, it has no antiviral properties, and that's been shown over and over again. Now, if you get a secondary infection, yeah, most likely you need to be in the hospital so Dr. Yango can take care of you. <laughs> we will give you the right antibiotic. Yeah. So. And I think this has been said before, we, antibiotics do not affect a virus. And that is what this is. It's a virus. And so we want to make sure that we are giving correct information. I, thank you, Dr. Duggins, for reinforcing that, that this is, this is not, antibiotics do not help with a virus. All right. So the last question um, is, if you're taking vitamin D, if you are taking those vitamins, what are, you know, how much is too much? What should we be doing? Um, I know Dr. DeHart said if if worse if if you can't take anything else, then at least just take a minute uh, a multi. But if I'm trying to, you know, you said Dr. Stanley, you said that you know most of us are vitamin D deficient. So what should I be doing? 
Well, ideally, you should have a baseline vitamin D level drawn. So because that that's what really guides dosage for vitamin D3. Um, a lot of times people don't have that benefit. I don't advise not taking vitamin D because you can't get your blood drawn. Even if you started at 2000 in an IU, and that may sound like a lot, but in my practice where I do get a chance to measure and guide the dosage, my average client requires 5,000 IU just to even get close to 50. Um, but that's my experience. So ideally, you want to be able to have it measured and then let that guide. If you can't do that, I would say safely, and you can you can check me. There's a Dr. Holick, H-O-L-I-C-K, who is a researcher, well-known vitamin D, um, who who can guide you. And he, he'll say higher levels. I'm saying if you're unsure, 2,000 is going to help, 2,000 IU daily. But you probably need more, but that should be guided by measurement. All right. We have five minutes left. So I'm going to give you all 30 seconds to tell us one last thing that you want people to know about the vaccine. Why should they go out there and take it, given the opportunity? Dr. D. Hart, start. It's safe. It's been proven to be safe. I would much rather have had a sore arm for a day and a half than uh, to be calling my personal doctor to say, I cannot breathe. Mm -hmm. Breathing is one of our most um it's a function that we don't realize how important it is until we cannot breathe, until we see a patient who cannot breathe. So take the vaccine so we can breathe. Dr. O. Yanga? You know, I would say that you know, for us to stop the pandemic, you know, as many people need to be, get vaccinated, there'll be numbers out there, maybe 70 to, you know, 70 to 80 percent. So uh, as, as much as we are individuals, we are part of a community, you know, uh, <clears throat> part of the you know, African-American community, but we're also part of the nation. So we have a responsibility to ourselves and to our families to get the vaccine, but we also have a responsibility to the nation to get a vaccine so we can stop the pandemic, without which you know, we're not gonna achieve the uh, control of the pandemic. So it, we have to, you know, it's not that we, we just, we don't want to be the weak link you know, uh, in this pandemic. You know, without, without getting the vaccine, unfortunately, that's gonna be the case. You know. Dr. Deggins. Yeah, definitely get the vaccine. It's safe. It's been proven safe. Um, continue to do your work and work out. Uh, that's one thing that a lot of people don't stop to think about. Stay hydrated uh, in addition to the vitamins that you supplement your body with. Uh, that's important also. So get the vaccine because it's good for you and it's good for the, the community. It protects you and those around you. Dr. Stanley? Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. We are in a tailspin. It is dire right now. And the only way we're going to get on the other side of this without hundreds of thousands of more people dying, particularly people of color, is if we get this vaccine. We have to do it for ourselves and for our community. Thank you all for participating. We appreciate you. On behalf of the Wichita African American Council of Elders and the Black Alliance, we want to make sure that we uh, express to you, the community, how important it is for us to stick together. As someone mentioned it, Dr. Stanley mentioned earlier, we are in Kwanzaa. This is time for us to come together with collective work and responsibility. It is up to us to take care of the village. I also wanna again mention that last week we discussed the impact that the pandemic had on mental health. So if you go to the uh, Black Alliance page, it's not there yet, but it will be here in the next couple of days. We will have a mental health uh, brief that you'll be able to download that you'll be able to go on. There are resources both locally, statewide, and nationally for you to be able to get some information about mental health and things that you can do. There'll be some really nice little practices in there that you can do and use to make sure that you are staying on top of that. Again, www.wichitablackalliance.com or the Wichita Council of Elders Facebook page. And again, don't forget to use our text alert system by dialing 48. Four eight four eight. Uh, this is Michelle Van, and we are so appreciative of you taking the time to be with us. Um, thank you, Roland Martin, for live streaming. Without you, we would not be able to reach the amount of people that we have been able to reach. 
and we appreciate your platform for this discussion. Remember, we are on Facebook, we're in Periscope, we're in YouTube. Make sure that you go through, invite your friends, share with your friends. Uh, even though we're over, there is a multiplicity of times in which um, Mr. Martin will share with you uh, this particular um, show. And so we want you to make sure that you are sharing. Happy Kwanzaa, Happy New Year. Please stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, and stay away from other people. We love you and we want to see you in 2021. God bless you. It's a fact. African Americans have higher costs, hospitalizations, and deaths from COVID-19. Come on, people. Be smart. Avoid large crowds, wash your hands frequently, and mask up. Going to crowded bars right now, it is dangerous for you and the people that you love the most. Be patient. Those days will come back if we take extra caution for a few extra months. We've got this. Keep the holidays safe for every generation of your family. Protect them and protect yourself. Mask up.